Pi Theory students. Today we're going to talk about soprano and bass lines in 18th century or Baroque style. We're going to be comparing this with species counterpoint lines that we've been studying. We'll also introduce a new kind of concept called a chordal dissonance. And then we'll talk about how to end lines, in other words, how to make cadences for different purposes. First, in comparison with species counterpoint, the similarities with what we've been studying, there's a preference for steps over skips and leaps in melodic lines. There's a preference for contrary motion between the lines. We also like to have those imperfect consonances. Remember, those were thirds and sixths in the middle of a line. We would like the line to express the tonality at the beginning and end of the line. We can use some dissonance, but in a controlled way. Remember that we talked about passing tones, neighbor tones, suspensions, things like that. And we want each line to have a good contour. So those things don't change much. But we do have some differences. In the Baroque era, by the 18th century, lines were controlled by chord progressions. So when we studied triads and learned about things like a one chord or a five chord, this is a way of saying what's consonant and what isn't. So when we get a one chord, scale degrees one, three, and five are consonant. With a five chord, scale degrees five, seven, and two are consonant. And those things uh, get the two lines to work together to express both the chord and the consonances between the bass and soprano lines. The bass line will have more leaps, especially at the cadence. When we get to cadences, you'll see what we mean. The rhythms can vary somewhat. In species counterpoint, our first species were all whole notes. Our second species, two half notes against a whole note, etc. Here the rhythms can be shorter. In chorale style, they tend to be quarter notes mostly, with some half notes. Note repetitions are more common. Therefore, oblique motion is possible. The reason we have a lot more note repetitions happens when we have more syllables in words then we have pitches, therefore pitches repeat a few times so that we can get all the words in. This is a vocal style after all. And we do allow some chordal dissonances. So let's look at some examples here. In example 11.1 .1 in the book, it shows both a few note repetitions but also a preponderance of contrary motion in the way these two parts interact. So we see more contrary motion than anything else. We have a few places where we have note repetition from one set of notes to the other. But also, whereas our species counterpoint would always begin on an octave, here, as long as we're expressing the F major tonality, we can sometimes begin on a tenth or a third, and that's perfectly all right. In the next example, and I'm only going to play the beginning of this line from My Country Tis of Thee. To demonstrate that we can sometimes have oblique motion. And what that expresses here, even though it's note against note like first species, when we have this repeated pattern and a pattern going against that, 
we can have a passing tone in there. Now let's talk about chordal dissonances. This is caused by adding the 7th to a 5 chord. So a 5 chord normally has scale degrees 5, 7, and 2. When we add scale degree 4, it forms a tritone or diminished fifth between these voices and it forms a minor seventh between these voices and of course if we invert them the diminished fifth becomes an augmented fourth and the minor seventh becomes a major second like all dissonances these have to resolve in specific ways and let me show you how So imagine that we're in F major, and in F major, if we have a leading tone E, and remember that's a B flat, so the interval between them is a diminished fifth, the leading tone is going to go up to the tonic scale degree 4, which causes this chordal dissonance, will go down to scale degree 3. These are called tendency tones because of the strong tendency for them to resolve in specific ways. Okay, note they're going in contrary motion. If I flip these upside down, where I've got a B flat and an E, now it's scale degree 4. It'll still go down to scale degree 3 and scale degree 7 here will still go up to scale degree 1. But now instead of a diminished fifth to a third, we've got an augmented fourth going to a sixth. They're still moving in contrary motion. Let's look at the interaction between scale degree 5 and scale degree 4. So now when we have scale degree 5 here and scale degree 4 there, what usually happens is that 5 will leap up to 1 while scale degree 4 still goes down to scale degree 3. So we've got a 7th going to a 3rd. If we turn that upside down and put the B flat here and the C over there, that's an interval of a 2nd And now, because it's in the soprano and not the bass, scale degree 5 can stay put, while scale degree 4 still goes down to scale degree 3. On occasions, by the way, we can still take scale degree 5 up to 1, even in the soprano, Notice this is going with that leap in contrary motion to the bass line. But those are the chordal dissonances. So in the key of F, that was 7 and 4 going to 1 and 3, or turning that upside down, 4 and 7. going outward to 3 and 1. What you see in front of you here, 5 in the bass and 4 up there, or turn that upside down, or
That's how we treat chordal dissonances. So notice that we, when we have those chordal dissonances, scale degree 4 will always go to scale degree 3. Scale degree 7 will go up to the tonic. And finally, cadence patterns in each voice. We have endings that are more conclusive, endings that are less conclusive, and endings that are really inconclusive. I'll show you what we mean. So, for example, if I end a line like this, scale degrees 3, 2, and 1 in F, that sounds very conclusive. I could even play around with this a little bit. And that also sounds conclusive. Or even if I repeat the G, scale degree 2, There are other combinations that are conclusive as well. What they all have in common is that we move by step either from above the tonic or below the tonic and end on scale degree 1. In the soprano line, those make for conclusive endings. In the bass, while this is going on here, bass lines that end 5 to 1 sound more conclusive because they outline the dominant to the tonic chords and that's how we make conclusive endings here. How do we get to scale degree 5? A variety of ways. We can get there either from right below it, right above it, so can get there from scale degree 2, or from 1 and then back. Those are all very conclusive endings. The less conclusive ones in the melodies will be the ones that end on scale degree 3. And there are a number of ways to get there. Or. Or. Your book has a more complete list, but you get the idea. If I'm doing something less conclusive in the bass, then instead of going 5-1, Perhaps I'm ending 7-1 or even 2-1. So the things that we did in Species Counterpoint that made for a conclusive ending in the bottom part, here in this 18th century style, that's a little less conclusive than, than that. And finally, the inconclusive endings. Anything, regardless of how it gets there, that ends on scale degree 5, will sound less conclusive. And therefore, anything in the top line that ends on the notes of the 5 chord, whether it's scale degree 7, scale degree 2, or scale degree 5 will also sound inconclusive. When we start writing lines and decide what kind of cadence we want, we'll see how this works. That's all for today.